Welcome to Reversing Hashimoto's show. I'm your show host, Dr. Anshul Gupta, the world expert in Hashimoto's disease. I help people reverse their thyroid conditions by making personalized functional medicine plans. You can work with me with any part of the country now by making virtual functional medicine appointments. To book an appointment, look at the show notes. In this show, I am going to get experts from all over the world who are going to share latest information that will help you to reclaim your life back from dreadful thyroid disease. So welcome here. And today we have Dr. Tabatha Barber. Dr. Tabatha Barber has devoted her life to giving women a voice and a choice when it comes to their health and well-being. As a young girl, she struggled with self-esteem and identity issues, dealt with peer pressure, and survived the ridicule and stigma of becoming a teenage mother. As she shared in her first published book titled From White Trash to White Coat, The Birth of Catherine's Purpose, those events led Tabatha to find her purpose in life. With perseverance and grace, she was able to redirect her path in life and become a successful physician. Dr. Tabatha Barber is triple board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, menopause, and functional medicine. She has the unique situation of being licensed to practice medicine in over half the country. So now you have the ability to work with a functional physician virtually. She is a host of the Gutsy Gynecologist Show, where she shares her wisdom and unique perspective with women everywhere to claim their health. She's also a keynote speaker, mentor, wife, mom, and grandma. By incorporating functional medicine into her women's health practice, she is able to provide women with the tools they need to optimize their health and happiness which in turn allows those women to pursue their purpose in life. Dr. Barber, welcome over here. Thank you so much, Anshel. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, yes. You know, I'm so excited to talk about various things that you have to share. It's such a big topic of women's health, and especially in females with Hashimoto. So I want to delve into all those things that, you know, females can do to feel better. But before that, actually, I want to kind of hear your story. Like, how were you able to reclaim your health? (laughs) So my story started a long time ago. You know, you mentioned that I became a mom as a teenager. So I had a very traumatic pregnancy. A lot of things were done to me and not explained to me. I didn't really understand any of it. After I had my baby, I started losing weight. I felt super anxious and jittery, and I just didn't feel like myself. And I remember going and having testing done. They put me on a table and shot me up with iodine and told me that my thyroid was a problem. And they did something to me that caused it to kind of poop out and they put me on medicine and sent me on my way. And that's all I really remember because I was so young and so sleep deprived. And, you know, that was a stressful time. And that event or those events like really drove a purpose out of me that I needed to help women have a voice and a choice when it came to their health care, because nobody talked to me and I just felt clueless and frustrated because I, now I'm on this medication for my thyroid and I don't know why, and I don't feel much better. Now I'm just tired and exhausted all of the time and can't take care of my baby. And so I realized like, I got to get myself together, figure out how to become a doctor and give women better options because women shouldn't be treated that way. And, you know, I went through med school, I did all of that stuff and I figured out I had Hashimoto's, you know, no one really explained that to me and that my antibody levels were out of control. They were over a thousand. And, you know, when I was going through medical school and asking my attendings, why is this happening? Why are my antibody levels so high? Why do I need this thyroid medication? And the answer was always like, your thyroid is sluggish, your thyroid is sluggish. And there was no real root cause reason. And so 
it wasn't until I went on to study functional medicine a decade later that I finally understood the culmination of, you know, becoming a teenage mom with that, those major stressors and all of the triggers. I swam in a very heavy chlorinated swimming pool every day. I put iodine on my skin to help give me a suntan. That's how crazy I was. Um, And I had fluoride treatments every week as a child. So all of those halogens that were getting into my system, all of that stress, everything culminated in a perfect storm. And I developed this autoimmune condition. And so, you know, ever since I've figured all this out, I've been on a mission to help women understand that your thyroid does not just stop functioning. It does not just get sluggish for no reason. Your thyroid is very much a red flag of, hey, something's going on in the rest of your body, in one of your other systems, and your thyroid is being burdened, it's being taxed, it's either being triggered by something and being attacked by your own immune system, which is not okay, or it's carrying on the burden because you your adrenals are struggling or your sex hormones are off. Like There's so many root causes. And we just keep being told by conventional medicine that, yeah, you just have a sluggish thyroid. Yeah. You're just getting old. And really that's not how God created our bodies to work. Our bodies aren't meant to just stop functioning optimally. There is a reason. And so we need to get that word out. Oh, absolutely. Such an inspiring story. You know, like a lot of our viewers will actually relate to this story because that's their story. You know, they have been struggling for decades, have been told, I call them lies, where, you know, like, you know, nothing can be done to, you know, feel better. And there we know that there are so many things that can be done for all these females to kind of get better. And, you know, you were just discussing beforehand that, you know, the what we need is that, you know, physicians who are ready to listen to all these females who are struggling and, you know, which is lacking. So I'm glad that you are there. You are a functional gynecologist listening to all these females. We have the right tools to fix them. And we are very interested I can talking about all the hormonal dysfunction, especially like the hormonal imbalances in female hormones that happens in Hashimoto's and thyroid disorder. But before that, you know, like I'm interested in knowing more about this term functional gynecology, you know, because we don't have many functional gynecologists in the country. So what do you mean by function gynecologist and how is it different? Yeah. So, you know, I graduated medical school and I practiced for almost a decade as a conventional OBGYN. And I was on call probably every other night, most nights. I was doing surgery during the day, seeing patients all day, up all night. I was living a non-sustainable, horrible life. I was so sleep deprived. I was eating on the go to the delivery room, you know, between patients, or I wasn't eating. I was falling asleep at my desk between patients because I was so tired. I had completely neglected myself to take care of everybody else. And, you know, the typical OBGYN sees 30 to 40 patients every day. We have 15 minutes to hear your symptoms and give you the solution, which is usually a pill or scheduling a surgery or procedure. And so it's very much a Band-Aid approach. Like, what is your symptom? How can I get rid of that symptom? I don't have time to figure out the root cause of where that symptom is coming from and why that why your body is sending that symptom, that message. And so this Band-Aid approach, unfortunately, never stops the hemorrhage, right? You put the Band-Aid on, but you're still bleeding past it. And so then you need more Band-Aids and you never really fix the problem. You just end up having more problems. You know, you bleed out, then you're anemic, then you're tired. Like that's just the analogy. But what I found when I studied functional medicine is that there's reasons for all of this. Our body just doesn't go into dysfunction for no reason. And if you stop focusing on what band-aid and figure out fixing the root cause of the issue, then you have actual resolution and return to health. And so what I came to realize is say heavy periods are a great example. 
heavy periods, I would give you a birth control pill traditionally that shuts down your own hormone production. It shuts down the communication between your brain and your ovaries, and it overrides your system to control it with the synthetic hormones that didn't actually figure out the problem. You were having heavy periods because of your liver not functioning properly, or, you know, your gut microbiome being in dysbiosis or something other than that to mold toxicity. There's a reason you're having heavy periods. So giving you a birth control doesn't actually fix the problem. It just masks the symptom, you know, and often I would see a woman, she would do that for a while. She would continue to have issues or not like the pill. So we would try the Mirena IUD. We would do the endometrial ablation. We do the hysterectomy. We go through all these steps, trying to get rid of that symptom, not addressing the actual estrogen dominance. And what I came to see after years and years is that very often those women who had estrogen dominant symptoms that I kept giving them, you know, band-aids, they ended up having breast cancer four or five years later because no one ever dealt with the fact that their hormones were imbalanced. And so I realized we have to do things better. We have to do things a different way. So I no longer even do surgeries. I don't find them necessary. When you actually fix the root cause issues, get those hormones back into balance, all those symptoms go away. The fibroids stop growing. The endometriosis stops growing. You stop having heavy periods. All of that gets better. And it's actually, you know, a root cause resolution. And so that is the huge difference between conventional gynecology, which I strongly feel are doing women a huge disservice. They're not giving true informed consent when they're giving these pills and these surgeries. They're not fixing the cause, the issue, and they're creating new symptoms and issues. So you have to approach your gyne issues from a functional, you know, standpoint. Oh, this is amazing. You know, like, because each and every female that sees us, you know, once they're going to gynecology, they're regular gynecologists, as you said, most of them are putting them on birth control pills or like IUDs or straight away, even like, you know, females in their thirties and forties are losing their uterus and ovaries. And then, you know, like they're just left on their own to suffer. So, you know, like there is good hope for them, you know, like by doing the functional medicine approach by natural ways, you know, we can reverse these diseases and make them feel better. So this is amazing that you're you're doing that. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned my issues back as a teenager, I had already been on birth control pills for over two years when I got pregnant. So what I know now that I didn't know when I signed up to be on birth control is that birth control damages the lining of your gut and causes increased intestinal permeability, AKA leaky gut. It depletes you of, you know, vitamins and minerals that are super essential for you to be able to metabolize your hormones. And the biggest thing for me was I had autoimmune genes. And when you have leaky gut and those triggers, that autoimmune process gets turned on. And so I didn't know what I was signing up for when I was just handed a birth control pill at 15. So we need to stop being so flippant and giving our teenage girls synthetic hormones that actually do damage to our body. You know, I am not against birth control. It helped me get through medical school and not have a second baby for a while, you know, but you should use it for birth control pill and you should know what you're getting yourself into so that you don't necessarily stay on it for 20 or 30 years like so many women do. Use it when you need it and use a different option after that. I think we just were not giving women the full truth of the story and it, it's not okay. Oh, absolutely. You pointed out correctly that even birth control pills, now the research does support that they can have long-term effects on a woman's body. So absolutely, when they're signing up, nobody talks about these long-term effects. Everybody feels they're completely safe. So knowing what you're signing up is important and then taking an informed decision. I think that's that's an important, relevant point. Yeah, without a doubt. Hmm. So now let's talk about like 
how is hashimotos related to like female hormones you know and what kind of female hormone dysfunction we see in hashimotos patients so yeah thyroid hormone is like i said a hormone just like our sex hormones estrogen progesterone testosterone those are also hormones insulin from our pancreas is a, is a hormone that manages our blood sugar so we have all these you know messengers in our body that are trying to send signals to do something our thyroid is saying speed up your metabolism slow down your metabolism fix your thermostat whatever and unfortunately the medical system doesn't really acknowledge the fact that all of these systems are interconnected and, you know, communicating with each other and trying to work together. You know, you go to see your ologist, your endocrinologist and your gastroenterologist and your gynecologist. And we act like these systems are in silos and they're, you know, just themselves when in reality, your gyne issues are very much involved in your endocrine issues and your gastro issues. And so I very commonly see women who have sluggish thyroid. We like to say that, but there's a reason for it. You know, like you've talked about and probably have other experts mentioning, we get this thyroid dysfunction because it's feeling the burden of, from our other systems. And that makes it harder for our sex hormones. You know, low thyroid production decreases our sex hormone binding globulin. And that is like, I think of a bus filled with hormones going around, dropping hormones off at different stations in your body. You know, you got estrogen on the bus. It's dropping it off at your bones. It's dropping it off at your brain. It's dropping it off at your gut. And if your sex hormone binding globulin is too much, that means you can't get off the bus. And so if it's too low, everybody's getting off the bus. And so when your thyroid is low, your estrogen can get really high. You can get this estrogen dominance picture. And so that's the most common thing I see women probably 35 to 50 is their thyroid is struggling because they've had a chronic viral issue. They've been exposed to too many halogens, they're eating inflammatory diet. Um, they've had too many heavy metals in their system. And then their estrogen levels start to rise and you get this picture of estrogen dominance and low thyroid. And so it's like, I'm exhausted. My hair is falling out. My periods are heavy. My breasts hurt. I don't want to get out of bed and do anything anymore. And like, this is a very common picture in this day and age. And it's crazy because when I think back to medical school and for you probably as well, that really wasn't a diagnosis that we learned estrogen dominance. And we didn't learn, you know, we weren't taught that endometriosis was rampant. It was like exciting to have an endometriosis case as a med student because it wasn't that common, but the problem is we have so many environmental toxins coming in from us all day long, every day in, in this day and age that our bodies are struggling. And so our great grandmothers didn't have estrogen dominance. It wasn't really a problem. And so it's a problem now. And it always, it like really ties into our crazy stressful lives. We're busy professional women trying to do all this stuff. We have more plastics and environmental toxins than we've ever had in the history of civilization. And, you know, we're putting too much strain on our bodies. So there's like five main causes of estrogen dominance. You know, you got too much cortisol production, you're stressed out, you have um, xenoestrogens from the environment, all those plastics, you have a sluggish liver because you're drinking too much alcohol, taking too many medications, trying to detox those toxins that are coming in those xenoestrogens. Then you have the gut issue. So your gut actually changes your hormone levels. And then progesterone, progesterone naturally starts to decline as you age and don't ovulate consistently. And chronic cortisol production from stress can contribute to that as well. It will steal progesterone. So lots of reasons why these imbalances are happening. And we could have discussions on that all day long. But what I want women to realize is you can't 
just take hormones and get your hormones balanced. If your thyroid's not functioning, if your adrenals aren't functioning because they are interacting and they are affecting one another. And so it's really important to do the comprehensive functional approach and attack all aspects of what's going on. Wow. Yeah, that is actually important. A lot of my patients actually do not know that a lot of their actually medical symptoms, which is irregular menstrual periods or heavy periods or endometriosis, all of them are actually because of estrogen dominance. And as you said, you know, like the conventional medicine never use a terminology. And then it's a blanket treatment. And you said, doesn't matter whichever problem you have, you just get a birth control pill, right? They just kind of shut down your hormones or maybe give external hormones. But we have other ways in functional medicines to fix this exogen dominance. So let's talk about those now. Yeah, I would love to mention to women, I just want women to understand that your gynecologist is not a hormone expert. We go to them thinking they are the women's health expert, but honestly, the OBGYN residency is a surgical residency. I spent four years learning how to remove your organs, learning how to sew you up after having babies and you have a tear, learning how to do procedures in the office to handle abnormal pap smears. I did not learn anything extra on hormones and the endocrine system and all these intricate systems. I didn't learn more than the family practice doctor and the internist. We all kind of just had this basic baseline knowledge. And that was about all I learned. So I don't even want women to be mad or frustrated about it. That's just the honest truth that they are surgeons. They're not hormone experts. And so if you go to them and say, can you check my hormones? Can we do these tests, figure this out? They usually say no, and there's no point in being frustrated because they just weren't trained to do that. And so it really is important for you to find a practitioner who's actually been trained and understands hormones. So there are so many amazing things. So I mentioned the five reasons for estrogen dominance, and you got to hit all of those reasons. So you do need to see if you need some progesterone replacement, because here's the thing. Estrogen is like a growth hormone. You are putting it out to grow your boobs, grow your hips, you know, grow the lining of the uterus because your body thinks it might get pregnant. The progesterone is kind of trying to keep that in check from overgrowing and keep everything in sync. And so progesterone is our calming hormone. I think of it like an anti-anxiety hormone. It's like your natural volume. It helps you sleep. It prevents you from being anxious. Whereas estrogen is like, let's go, let's get things done. Let's do stuff. So you want a nice balance of that. And if your progesterone is declining because of the natural loss of reproduction, sometimes you want to replace that so that your estrogen and progesterone are back into balance. You want to address the gut. I can't emphasize this enough. You have to have a healthy gut microbiome and a healthy gut lining for you to be able to eliminate your estrogens. So there's actually bacteria that will produce an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. This beta-glucuronidase will cut the garbage tag off of your estrogen that your liver worked so hard to put on there and that you're trying to eliminate these estrogens. So if you have too much estrogen, your liver finally gets it, you know, to go out into the stool, that bacteria will cut the garbage tag off. Then you will reabsorb it and you'll have too much estrogen again. Most women nowadays are constipated because of low thyroid function and other issues, poor diet. The longer that stool sits in the intestines, the longer those estrogens have to get reabsorbed. And so the constipation is just magnifying the issue. So it's very important to know what's living in your gut, what's running the show, are you making too much of this enzyme? Are you reabsorbing your estrogens too much? And figure all that out. You got to get, we call that phase three of your detoxification process in your body. You got to get that moving and functioning before you can do anything else. Then you go to the liver. That's phase one and phase two. They take your estrogen after you're done using it and they 
turn it into an inactive form. They metabolize it. And you need certain vitamins and minerals for that metabolism to even happen. So if you're deficient or depleted, you're going to struggle. And if you are drinking alcohol regularly, you're going to struggle. If you're taking Tylenol PM every night, you're going to struggle. There's so many reasons that your liver doesn't metabolize your estrogens properly. We can also have genetic mutations, little SNPs. I unfortunately have MTHFR and a COMP mutation. So I struggle to methylate and deactivate and remove my estrogens. So that can be a piece of the puzzle. So you really want to figure all that out. How am I metabolizing? Am I reabsorbing and recirculating? What am I doing with these hormones? Conventional gynecologists might check your blood levels for estrogen. If you really talk them into it, that will tell you how much estrogen you produced, but it does not tell you what your body's doing with it from there. So that's, you know, a little bit helpful, but not the full picture. Um, and then stress, you have to see what your adrenal glands are doing, because if you're pumping out cortisol all day long to handle all your stresses, all your crazy emails, all your kids, you know, your deadlines, like that will rob your progesterone and tank it. That will worsen your estrogen. That will tell your thyroid we're in survival mode. You better turn everything down right now. You know, your thyroid will put on the brakes, hardcore, your metabolism will slow down. You'll start gaining weight. You'll be exhausted. Your hair will start falling out. So you have to figure out how to set boundaries in your life, get control of your stress and really get those adrenal glands back into a nice pattern and function so that you, your other systems can function again. Wow. Those are so many great tips, you know, like, and things that <laughs> it's a <laughs> lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that kind of tells us that, you know, like, is this not a simple approach of just giving you or handling your pill and everything is gone. Right. You know, and yeah. that's what I talk to my clients is that we need to go like dig deeper, figure out all the root causes and then, you know, fix you from inside out. You know, otherwise we, as you mentioned that we're just putting band-aids and they are never going to feel better. So that is the situation. Now let's talk about a little bit about these testing methods, because, you know, like, you know, I see so many females coming to see me. I went to my gynecologist, they ordered the blood work, you know, for my hormones and everything looked perfect. So they said, you know, nothing is wrong with your hormones, you know, and then, so don't worry about talking about it. But obviously in functional medicine, we know these specialized tests, which tells us the whole picture. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about that, you know, what kind of testing we're talking about and how do you test them? Yeah, I think this is really important for women to understand that when you get blood work drawn for your hormones, there's a lab reference range on the resulting page and it will say estrogen like 10 to 800 is normal. It's literally saying that you made a little bit of estrogen, so you're in the normal range, or you don't have a tumor, you're not pumping out gallons of estrogen, so you're normal. That is a very antiquated way of looking for disease. We're not looking for optimal health or balance or any of that. We are looking for outright disease that needs to be treated. So those reference ranges mean nothing. And a lot of conventional doctors use those ranges to tell you you're fine. And you're really not fine because your hormone levels change every day of the month depending on where you are in your cycle. And so it requires someone who understands that cycle, that natural progressive increase, then decrease, then increase again. They need to know the pattern of those hormone levels to be able to interpret those results appropriately. And that is the big piece that's missing in conventional medicine. The other issue I mentioned is it's telling you how much your body made that day, that moment in time, but it's not telling you, telling me what you did the rest of the month. It's not telling me, did your body metabolize it and send it down to the liver appropriately? Here's the other issue. It might not go to the liver. It might turn into something called 4-hydroxyestrone, which can damage DNA and increase your risk of breast and uterine cancer. So you need to know how is your estrogen being metabolized? Because that very much changes 
your risk of what these estrogens are doing to your body. And so there is more advanced testing. There's functional testing that will tell you all of this. It's amazing. We use urine and saliva because those are more accurate. They show all the metabolites that those estrogens get turned into. And so we can see all of this. Then we know exactly where to trigger our treatment. Hey, you need to, you know, have more antioxidants. You're going down this DNA damaging pathway. We really need to get you off of here and back over to like pushing toward your liver or you're recirculating too much. We need to change your microbiome. We need to get you pooping. Like we will know exactly where the treatment needs to be as opposed to here's your birth control pill. Let's shut down your own hormones and not really fix the issue. Yes. You know, that is so important, you know, like again, you know, like, uh, unless we know where the problem is in that hormone cascade, you know, we cannot fix it. So once we see that whole cascade, it is so easy to make an intervention. And then obviously, you know, like we can fix the root cause of the issue. So the next thing, you know, we'd like to talk about a little bit about is these hormone replacement, because such a big controversial topic and such like, you know, thing. Um, and there are different camps of people. And I think a lot of people do not understand the hormone replacement that we talk about. So you mentioned an estrogen dominant, sometimes we need progesterone as a replacement. So what kind of progesterone are we talking about? And then, you know, like, uh, tell us about like, do you use estrogen as a replacement also? So a little bit about those replacement therapies. Yeah, so I came out of um, medical school during the WHI report. So there was a huge trial done for a long, long time with nurses across the country and other women. And they were studying the effects of hormone replacement therapy. There was two camps. There was an estrogen only and a estrogen and progestin only or combined. So they stopped the trial early because of some results that came out and the media took control of this and went crazy. They created fear in everybody and immediately told all doctors to take women off of their hormone replacement therapy. It was very dramatic and it hurt a lot of women. So it was a knee jerk reaction based on inaccurate reports and a lot of women suffered because of it. So it came out and said, hormone replacement therapy causes breast cancer and blood clot and stroke, and it's not safe for women. And you need to, you know, take all of your patients off of it. So I came out of residency being taught that hormones are very scary. They're not safe yet. I was trained in how to prescribe synthetic hormone replacement. There was never any talk about bioidenticals or, you know, the difference between the synthetic hormones that were studied and what our body actually makes. So this is what I had to learn through functional medicine and, you know, really combing through the research and all of the research that has come out since that inaccurate study. So the problem with that study was the average age woman was 63. She was already 10 years postmenopausal when she was started on hormones. The majority of the women in the study already had heart disease developing. They, they smoked. They were not candidates for hormone replacement therapy in the first place, yet they were put on them. The bigger issue is that it, they were synthetic hormones. They were made from conjugated equine estrogen, horse urine, and synthetic progestins. Synthetic progestins are not the same as your body's natural progesterone. Conventional doctors have been trained that it is, but what we now understand is that it's very different. They both cause the lining of your uterus to stop growing, but their effects on the rest of your body are very different. And so... What I saw in my practice over a decade is most women did not feel good on synthetic progestins. That's like the Depo Provera shot, the Nexplanon rod in your arm, the Mirena IUD. They cause weight gain, they cause depression and anxiety. Women don't feel like themselves. And so natural progesterone 
does the opposite. It makes you feel calm and good. It keeps your weight in check. So there's a huge difference. And I would never prescribe synthetic progestins at this point in my career. I only use bioidentical progesterone. Luckily, you can get that as a prescribed medication covered by your insurance. It's just called micronized progesterone. Doctors are starting to understand the difference. They're starting to be trained and realize that it's um, healthier to use that than a synthetic progestin like Provera or Prempro, but it's going to take a while. So the other piece of it is that those estrogens, you know, I mentioned it was made from horse urine. Our body doesn't see it the same chemically as the natural estradiol that we make. You can get estradiol, which is bioidentical in a prescription form. You can get it as a patch. You can get it as a pill. Here's the thing. When we take that oral estradiol pill, our bacteria in our gut actually changes it to estrone, about two thirds of it into estrone. And so before we even absorb it into our bloodstream, we're already metabolizing it into the form we don't want. And so I try not to use oral estradiol because that can increase your risk of, you know, forming that 4-hydroxy, which can damage DNA and increase your risk of breast and uterine cancer. So I just don't think it's worth it. And the oral estrogen has to be metabolized through the liver and increases your risk of blood clot and stroke. So if you do an estradiol patch, you avoid all of that and you just get the bioidentical estradiol and you feel better. So you need a practitioner who understands all these nuances because it absolutely matters what they're prescribing to you and why they're prescribing it. So there's a time and a place. The other big important piece of it is to understand perimenopause the time before you completely stop having periods and your hormones stay low and don't fluctuate any longer, that there can be a five to 10 year time period where your hormones are changing and they're not regular. And so you want to balance that time period as much as possible, because that's where all the symptoms are. That's the hot flashes, the night sweats, the mood swings, the breast tenderness, the heavy periods. And so you really want to make sure that your estrogen isn't going way high and way low, way high and way low. It's like this crazy roller coaster and progesterone's not on board. So if you get progesterone on board and you do all the things we talked about, you will flatten that roller coaster curve and your estrogen levels won't be so dramatic and you'll have less symptoms. So Perimenopause is very much about getting your lifestyle reeled in, doing the self-care every single day, doing all of that work. That is where you're going to get rid of those symptoms because you're actually fixing the root cause of the issue. Progesterone is usually what we, you know, replace during that time. We, we don't replace estrogen because one day it's really high, the next day it's really low. And so it usually makes women feel worse. Women usually will complain of weight gain and worsening breast tenderness and that type of thing. So I don't usually start replacing estrogen until they're done having periods and that estrogen is consistently low and their follicle stimulating hormone from their brain is consistently high. Testosterone is the other piece that doesn't get talked about for women. We act like that's just for men, but literally we make testosterone. That's the most abundant hormone that we make and we need it. it it's what gives us drive to get up in the morning and actually do stuff. It gives us strength. It keeps our weight in check because it builds muscle mass. It gives us our libido. Testosterone is really important and you want to make sure that the level is good. So you make some in your ovaries and you also make it from your adrenal glands. So if you're that crazy stressed out woman that we all are, your adrenal glands are probably not making as much testosterone. And then your ovaries during this transition stop making as much. And all of a sudden you have no libido. You can't think straight. You don't want to get out of bed and do anything anymore. Um, 
And a lot of that can be contributed to, oh, you just, your adrenals are tanked, you know, or your thyroid is sluggish. And that doesn't get evaluated a lot of times by practitioners. And, and that's a really important piece of the puzzle. So I just can't stress it enough. You have to do this comprehensive evaluation. You have to look at everything without a doubt. Absolutely. So the bottom line is that, you know, the re hormone replacement has a place to it, but you need to go to a doctor like you who understands the nuances of when there is a right approach and what kind of hormone replacement should be done so that, you know, you're doing it in a safe manner, right? Yeah. The research is clear that keeping you in a perimenopausal level of hormone status slows the aging process. It slows the development of diseases like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, bone loss, dementia. When women go into menopause and have those low levels, those diseases start to develop because we have estrogen receptors all over our body and progesterone receptors and testosterone receptors, and they directly affect how our body functions. So we clearly know now that once your estrogen level is low, your arteries get hard. They don't bend and move the way they used to. They're not as elastic and plastic you know, pliable. And so women develop heart disease. That is like the number one killer of women after menopause. And so the research clearly shows that being on safe bioidentical hormone replacement therapy after menopause increases your longevity and the quality of your life. So I, you know, that's an individual decision that every woman should have the ability to make, whether you want to just go into menopause naturally and make the best of it, or if you want to slow that process down. Here's an interesting tidbit. You know, at the turn of the century, last century, 1900, our average age was 49. So we didn't live past menopause. Now we live half of our life past menopause. And by the time we're hitting menopause, we're at the prime of our careers and our lives. We're just starting to like, our kids are old enough. We can hang out with our husbands and enjoy those relationships and travel and do all that stuff. I don't want to age and go, you know, down the path of disease. I want to slow that process as much as possible. So we've advanced so quickly as a society, our bodies physiologically are struggling to keep up. I think one day menopause will probably get pushed back. It'll continue to increase to the point where it's probably in the sixties or seventies, but for now it is what it is. And so it's completely up to you how you want to live that second half of your life. And there's a definitely a safe way to do it. Wow. That's a lot of information and a lot of encouragement, you know, like for females, you know, I think, you know, like most of the females things, once they hit menopause, that's the end of the story. You know, like then they all expect that, oh, you know, like my weight gain or my, you know, uh, decrease in sex drive or my heart disease or me like, you know, looking so old is inevitable. But what you're telling us is that, you know, it's that's not the end of the story. You know, there is so much stuff that, you know, all these females can do to feel better. Yeah, I mean, think about the fact that estrogen really plays a significant role in your immune system, which is necessary because when you get pregnant, half of that baby is foreign DNA and you don't want your body to attack it because it will abort it. You will miscarry. So your immune system gets downregulated during pregnancy. That is all based on estrogen levels. Estrogen very much controls a woman's immune system. So when she goes into menopause, her immune system down regulates once again. And I so often see women develop Hashimoto's at that time because of that. And so, you know, women are given this diagnosis, they're put on Synthroid, they're sent on their way. Now they have to live with low hormone status and thyroid, low thyroid function. It's a mess. It feels horrible. And so often you're not getting the Hashimoto's diagnosis. And so you're not 
knowing that you need to stop your immune system. So it's very complex, but I want women to have hope that there actually is answers and there's ways to feel better. It is not normal to just be miserable because you're aging or because you're menopausal. You don't have to be that way. It, you know, there is another way completely. Wow. Thank you so much. You know, like this was so like enlightening and so empowering for all the women who are listening that, you know, they have so much hope for, you know, getting better. And this is not, you know, kind of end of their life or end of the story that, you know, they can do so much stuff. So thank you for sharing all this information, but tell our viewers where they can find you. Yeah. So you can find me at drtabatha.com. It's T-A-B-A-T-H-A, no I's, just A's. Um, Or follow me at Instagram and TikTok at the Gutsy Gynecologist. But I hope women feel hopeful because there are answers out there. You can have an amazing life and feel awesome. You know, I'm living proof. (laughs) Yes, you are. You are an inspirational for a lot of women, inspirational for physicians like me. Uh, who kind of, you know, admire women like you who have been doing, gone through these things. And, you know, you are on this journey of helping so many women. So thank you so much for doing that. My pleasure. Well, thank you so much for coming us on the show. Okay. Yeah. Take care. All right. Take care.